we therefore develop this curious thing. We, we, we develop a thing which is called an ego. Now, I've got to be very clear to you what I mean by an ego. An ego is not the same thing as a particular living organism. For my philosophy, the particular living organism, which is inseparable from a particular environment, that is to say, from the universe as centered here and now, there's something real. It isn't a thing. I call it a feature of the universe. But what we call our ego is something abstract, which is to say it has the same order and kind of reality as an hour or an inch or a pound or a line of longitude. It is for purposes of discussion. It is for convenience. In other words, it is a social convention that we have what is called an ego. But the fallacy that all of us make is that we treat it as if it were a physical organ, as if it were real in that sense, when in fact it is composed on the one hand of our image of ourselves, that is our idea of ourselves, as when we say to somebody, you must improve your image. Now, this image of ourselves is obviously not ourselves, any more than an idea of a tree is a tree, any more than you can get wet in the word water. And to go on with, our image of ourselves is extremely inaccurate and incomplete. Would that some God, the gifted, gives to see ourselves as others see us. We don't. So my image of me is not at all your image of me. And my image of me is extremely incomplete in that it does not include any information to speak of about the functioning of my nervous system, my circulation, my metabolism, my subtle relationships with the entire surrounding human and non-human universe. So the image I have of myself is a caricature. It is arrived at through, mainly, my interaction with other people who tell me who I am in various ways, either directly or indirectly, and I play about with what their picture is of me, and they play something back to me so that we set up this conception. And this started very, very early in life. And I was told, you see, and you were told, that we must have a consistent image. You must be you. You have to find your identity in terms of image. And this is an awful red herring. A lot of the current quest for identity among younger people is a search for an acceptable image. What role can I play? Who am I in the sense of what am I going to do in life? And so on. Now, while that has a certain importance, if it's not backed up by deeper matters, it's extraordinarily misleading. So therefore, on the one hand, there is this image, which is intellectual, emotional, imaginative, and so forth. Now, we would say, I don't feel that I am only an image. I feel there's something more real than that because I feel, I mean, I have a sense of there being a particular sort of, how do we say, a center of something, some sort of sensitive core inside the skin. And that corresponds to the word I. Let's take a look at this. Because the thing that we feel as being myself is certainly not the whole body. Because a lot of the body can be seen as an object. 
In other words, if you stand, stretch yourself out, lie on the floor, and turn your head and look at yourself, you know, you can see your feet and your legs and all this up to here, and finally it all vanishes, only there's a sort of a vague nose in front. And you assume you have a head because everybody else does, and you've looked in a mirror, and that told you you had a head, but you could never see it, just like you can't see your back. So you tend to put your ego on the side of the unseen part of the body, the part you can't get at, because that seems to be where it all comes from, and you feel it. But what is it that we feel? Because if I see clearly, and my eyes are in functioning order, the eyes certainly are not conscious of themselves. There are no spots in front of them, no defects, in other words, in the lens or in the retina or in the optic nerves that give hallucinations. So also, therefore, if my ego, my consciousness is working properly, I ought not to be aware of it as something sort of there, being a nuisance in a way in the middle of things, because your ego is awfully hard to take care of. <laughs> well, what is it then that we feel? Well, I think I've discovered what it is. It's a chronic, habitual sense of muscular strain which we were taught in the whole process of doing spontaneous things to order. When you're taking off in a jet plane and the thing has gone rather further down the runway than you think it should have without getting up in the air, you start pulling at your seatbelt. Get this thing off the ground. Perfectly useless. So in the same way, when our community tells us, look carefully, now listen, pay attention, we start using muscular strains around our eyes, ears, jaws, hands, to try to use our muscles to make our nerves work, which is, of course, futile. And in fact, it gets in the way of the functioning of the nerves. Try to concentrate. And then when we try to control our emotions, we hold our breath, pull our stomachs in, or tighten our rectal muscles to hold ourselves together. Now pull yourself together! Immediately, what are you to do? What does a child understand by that? He does it muscularly, pulls himself together. This is useless. So everybody chronically pulls themselves together so that it's so funny if you get a person to just lie on the floor and relax. Well, there's the floor under you as firm as can be holding you up. Nevertheless, you will detect that the person is making all sorts of tensions lest he should suddenly turn into a nasty jello on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so that chronic tension, which in Sanskrit is called sankocha, which means contraction, is the root of what we call the feeling of the ego. So that, in other words, this feeling of tightness is the physical referent for the psychological image of ourselves. So that we get the ego as the marriage of an illusion to a futility. Even though the idea of an I with a name, with a being, is naturally useful, for social communication, provided we know what we're doing and take it for what it is. But we are so hung up on this concept that it confuses us even in the proposition that it might be possible for us to feel otherwise because we ask the question, if we hear about people who have uh, transcended the ego, well, we ask, how do you do that? Well, I say, what do you mean? You, how do you do that? Because the you you're talking about doesn't exist. So you can't do anything about it. Any more than you can cut a cheese with a line of longitude. <laughs> Now, that sounds very discouraging, doesn't it? 